Friends, it is wonderful to be with you. It's wonderful to hear your voices back. So a couple of announcements I'd like to share with you. First of all, today, we're delighted to have Lola and Lisa sharing some special music with us. They will be sharing that early on in the service. We look forward to that. And then also, you will notice as you leave today, on the table outside on the little front porch, there are copies of the upper room for these two months in the large size and the small size. All the ones that we received, we have placed out there. They are in the uh, plastic baggies. We hope you'll take the opportunity to take those as you leave today. And then we just want to remind you that for those of you who on weeks that you're not able to make it, you can watch, still watch us on the FaceTime, on the YouTube, and on the church website. Also, just a reminder that we are working on live streaming, and that should be coming in the next few weeks. We have the equipment, we're perfecting it, and that should work out well. Those are the announcements I wanted to share today. And so now I would invite us to share our call to worship. You are welcome to stand if you like. Gracious God, thank you for loving us unconditionally. Loving God, thank you for your love. God of strength and power and wisdom and compassion, please help us to understand and live our life of loving as you love.
the folks in a nice, clean plastic bag. There we go. Thank you. All right. If I don't stand here, you won't see me. All right. Or well, wait a minute. You were actually pointing to take the blanket over, not me. I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. So here we are. Just a beautiful example of the blankets that are made. All right. So now we're going to have the opportunity to bless these. Can somebody give me a count of how many we will be donating? Uh, right now we're probably about 55, 56. Okay, so 55 or 56 will be donated to the Women's or to the Victim Resources Center at the YWCA. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today that we have this opportunity to celebrate your love. We give you thanks for the gifts that were created by these wonderful folks from our church family. And we pray now that these gifts will be used to provide warmth and a sense of peace to those who are struggling as they are the victims of different kinds of abuse. Bless these blankets and bless each and every person who receives one. Amen. All right. So what we're going to do, I don't want anybody to ever say that we're not liturgical here. We will just turn this. How's that look? Pretty liturgical, huh? I never took that class in seminary. Okay. All right. This is pretty impressive. <coughs> All right, friends. And now we have the opportunity to bless our tithes and offerings. You know, I talk to a lot of other clergy, and one of the things that is absolutely remarkable about our church family is that throughout this situation where we were not able to worship in person, our offerings and our tithes continued. To commit and they continue to commit now that is a sign of your commitment to God's love and to your appreciation for the ministry that we do we know that things look different there are no offering plates that are out for us to pass there are no ushers collecting them but we do have a box which is similar to what many of the churches that I've been talking to have and we have the opportunity to bless that offering now and bless you as those who have given. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the blessings that you give us, the blessings of love and life, the blessings of resources that enable us to have homes, to have food, and to have clothing, and to have transportation and medical care. And most of all, we are thanking, for, thanking you today for the gift of your love and the gift of eternal life that comes through your relationship with and our relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless these gifts and all who give it, and may these gifts be used for the furthering of your kingdom here on earth. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And now we have the opportunity to, again, hear some special music that Donna will share with us.
Friends, let's take a, a moment to share our silent prayers with God. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I ask that you give God thanks in your own way for the many blessings that he's given you. As your eyes are closed and your head is bowed, I invite you to open your heart and share with God those places in your life where you long for healing, where you long for comfort, for you and for those around you. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks today that we can be here. We thank you for the blessings that come to us when we gather in this place at this time to worship you, to hear songs of praise, and to hear music that calms our hearts and inspires our hearts. We thank you today for the ways that you have blessed us. When we took that moment to pray silently, the reality is that it was just a nanosecond that didn't allow us to thank you for all the blessings. When we pray and we ask for hope and healing for those who we love, it was just a nanosecond that didn't allow us to list all those concerns we have. Help us to see that silent prayer as a commercial that reminds us that that feeling of contentment, that feeling of joy that we experience when we go to you in prayer is something that's available to us each and every day. When we go home today, help us to sit down with a glass of iced tea, a glass of hot water, or no, cold water, and a, and a cup of hot coffee to help us contemplate all the blessings and all the needs in our life. We thank you for the gift of prayer. We pray for the leaders of our nation and the leaders of nations throughout the world. We live in difficult times. We live in times of disease and unrest. We pray today for healing. We pray that the leaders of all nations would make their decisions based on principles of honesty and integrity and a concern for the welfare of all human beings. We are reminded of the words of Genesis 1:27 that God created us all in his image. We're reminded that all means all. Help us to reflect on the ways that we can live out that love of God in our lives. We pray today for those serving in the armed forces here in the United States and in places throughout the world. We thank you for the sacrifices that were made in the past, and we thank you for the sacrifices that are made today. May we always be a grateful nation, appreciative of the sacrifice and the caring and the dedication of those who serve in the armed forces. We pray today for schools and school boards and education leaders as they contemplate what it means to return to education in the coming weeks. We pray now that as we continue with our worship service, that each one of us will open our hearts and open our minds to the power of the Holy Spirit. We are reminded of that old gospel hymn that says, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so today, each one of us, as we stand or sit in the need of prayer, we're reminded of the need to open our hearts to receive the gift that you have for us, that your Holy Spirit will deliver to us. 
We ask all these things as we give thanks for the opportunity to hear music, to hear scripture, and to hear the word of God. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name, who taught us to pray together when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning, friends, comes from Matthew chapter 13. This is a very familiar passage to many of us. It's a passage that is entitled The Parable of the Sower. Now, as you're hearing this passage today, I want you to have a visual in your mind, if you, if you can. I want you to visualize planting a seed. Now, some of you are very adept at doing that. Sometimes you get the the seed that's already gone and grown a little bit. Some of you have planted things from seeds. If not, you've watched other family members do it. Think about the image of planting a seed and the ground upon which that seed is planted. But then go deeper, because I want you to think that that story that we're hearing is not necessarily a story about planting seeds. It's about planting the love of God in our hearts and allowing that love of God to be shared with others. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, and then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell upon the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I will heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, 
they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good ground refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. May we be blessed by God's word as it comes to us today from the book of Matthew. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, touch us in those places deep within us where we long to feel your love and your care. Guide us and draw us closer to you. Amen. So friends, this is a, a story about, about planting seeds and about farmers. Or would-be farmers like some of us who have tomato plants in our yard. Some time ago, I saw a long list of wise sayings that were attributed to farmers. Let me just list a, list, of, list a couple of those wise sayings for each of you this morning. Maybe you can relate to those. Number one, keep skunks and bankers and lawyers and politicians at a distance. Number two, forgive your enemies. It messes up their heads. Do not corner something that you know is meaner than you. That got the biggest laugh so far. Life is simpler when you plow around the stump. Makes sense. And when you wallow with pigs, expect to get dirty. Now, Jesus told a lot of stories about farmers. Today's story from the Bible is one of those stories. However, the reality of this story is that the farmer in it was not particularly gifted as a farmer. The farmer went out to sow the seeds, says Jesus. He was scattering the seed. Some of it fell along the path. Well, everybody knows that you don't plant seeds where people are going to be walking, right? Even I figured that one out. Because it'll never grow. It won't penetrate the hard, packed soil that everybody keeps walking on. So, Jesus said, the birds came and they ate the seed that had fallen by the path. Some of the other seeds, Jesus said, fell on rocky places where there was a deficiency of soil. Again, not a very good place to sow seeds. The resulting plants sprang up quickly, but because the soil was so shallow, then when the sun came out, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, Jesus said, which grew up and choked out the plants. Another word for thorns would be weeds, and so it didn't survive either. This farmer is now zero for three at being a successful farmer. Looks like he's going to have a poor harvest this year. But finally, Finally, he gets lucky. Some of the seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a miraculous crop, up to 100 times what was sown. This would not be a bad year at all for him because where good seed falls on good soil, amazing things can happen. I was reading something that Robert Schuller wrote. Many of us are old enough to remember Robert Schuller and the the, the Crystal Cathedral in California, which some of you may know is now a, uh, a building that houses offices for the Catholic Diocese of that area. And <clears throat> Schuller said that anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the number of apples in a seed. The greatest thing in this world, including the kingdom of God, grows from tiny seeds. You see, the story that we're referring to as the parable of the sower is really not about farming at all. 
It's about a careless farmer. It's not about a careless farmer, but rather it is about a generous God who sows seeds of love and acceptance for all people. But different kinds of people respond in different ways to that love and acceptance. Jesus describes that in the context of the soil. So, so hear it again. Jesus spoke in this parable that we read. And if you go back and take a look at it later today, you'll see it. Jesus wants to know, is asked, why don't you tell these stories straight out? He says, I gotta use parables because you'll understand them. Other people won't understand them. There may have been a bit of secrecy involved too. The people who were hearing them were not people that could be trusted initially. But Jesus was using parables, using familiar stories to talk to people about the significant spiritual issues in life. You and I do that every day. We use examples from our life to explain the miracles of God's love. And for people who don't know about the gospel and who don't know about God, we are able to use our lives <clears throat> in spite of our humanity and our mistakes we're able to use our lives as an example of how God works miracles in the lives of people who he cares for. So, stay focused in on, the, on the kinds of soil today and see how it might relate to you and I. There's a pastor, uh, well, first of all, I'm gonna use this reference, but I gotta tell you, I was trying to come up with names of people to substitute because sometimes the, the people's names in the examples that I use are names of people in the congregation. And so the last thing I want is for you to think that I'm talking about one of you when I use these examples. So we're gonna try and, and substitute the name Jim for the guy in the example, all right? But that way you can just point at me and say, I knew he was terrible. Okay. So Pastor John Huffman tells about a man who he knows called Jim. Jim is in his mid-60s. Jim has gone to church all of his life. And he thinks of himself as being a very religious man. However, he has never let his religion get in the way of his lifestyle. That was a laugh now. All right. You have been out of practice for so long. I think we're going to start scheduling two services a week to get you back up to snow, okay? All right, so even though Bob considers himself a church man, and he's probably sitting in church right this... Uh, I said the wrong name. Jim. Even though Jim considers himself a church man, he's probably sitting in a church this very moment listening to a sermon somewhere, he really likes to control his own life. He hears the gospel every Sunday, but the seed never really penetrates the soul of his heart. Very few of the values that he hears in church are translated into Jim's everyday life. Jim knows what he wants, and very little of it fits the claims of Jesus on his life. The altar Jim worships at is the altar of Jim. Jim's problem is that he has committed himself to himself instead of to Jesus Christ. Jim is his own Lord. Jim is the king of his own life. He gets turned off by preaching that quotes too much from the Bible. Well, that's terrible. He wants comforting talk that talks about psycho -bell. He wants no mention of sin from the pulpit. According to him, that went out of style with the Middle Ages. Jim gets turned off by anything that might take him out of his comfort zone as Jim, a worshiper. You see, for Jim, going to church is like an inoculation, a vaccine against a contagious disease. He wants to get just enough religion to keep him from catching the real thing. I love that line, okay? Can you see that Jim is just as hardened to the gospel as the most adamant agnostic or atheist? In fact, Jim is more hopeless than those 
people because Jim has no awareness of the need in his own life. John Hoffman goes on to say, Jim reminds me of a soldier that I was reading about recently. This soldier, a sergeant, was a real hard case. The chaplain had been talking to him for weeks about his relationship to God, but he wasn't making much headway. One day, the chaplain, the sergeant, and some others got together for a volleyball game. When the sergeant stripped to his waist, took off his shirt for the game, the chaplain couldn't help but notice that the sergeant had the Lord's Prayer, the entire Lord's Prayer, tattooed on his chest. And the chaplain was absolutely stunned. There was the Lord's Prayer, but it was all on the outside. Its message had obviously not sunk in. You can't always judge by outward appearance who has hardened their heart to God. But this is the seed sown along the path. There's a second group represented by rocky soil. People who had faith and at one time it was firmly rooted but not firmly rooted enough. And they let it slip away. We all have met people who grew up with the life of the church. But then something happened. Perhaps it was the death of a loved one. Perhaps it was the loss of a job that they thought was their dream. Perhaps something that they've never been able to talk about. But the reality is they walked away from God completely. Tom Sutherland is a person who I read about recently. He's a man in that category. At one time, he was an outstanding Christian. He was an elder in his home church, but that was before he was held captive in Lebanon for six and a half years. During his captivity, Sutherland was in 26 locations where he was held prisoner. Some of the cells were cold, dark, underground, six foot by six foot holes. After 18 months of captivity, he was put in a solitary underground cell. He became so discouraged that he tried to commit suicide three times by pulling a plastic bag over his head. But at each time, he would think of his wife and three daughters and stop short of killing himself. Tom today is a free man. However, one casualty of his experience in Lebanon is that Tom no longer believes in God. When asked why, Sutherland answered, I prayed so many times and so hard. So hard I prayed. And nothing happened. Friends, I cannot tell you how many times throughout my ministry of over 30 years I have heard stories like that story. <clears throat> Gut-wrenching, painful stories. And we all feel compassion for Tom Sutherland. None of us know how we would have reacted in those circumstances. However, what we do know is that there were others who went through the same sort of experience and came home with their faith, strengthened, not weakened. Jerry Levin, a Middle East bureau chief for CNN, was taken captive in Lebanon. And he not only held on to his faith, but he even learned to pray for his captors and forgive them. Different people respond to life in different ways. Some of us lead very sheltered lives, but one day we too will be tested when we lose someone who we love or when our circumstances change. And the reality is we will have to decide how our faith will be maintained. The seed which fell among the thorns, Jesus says, refers to Christians who have let the worldly concerns, such as material things, choke their faith. Jesus could be talking about some of us. We live in a very materialistic society. Some of us believe that we can buy our way to happiness. Others of us believe we are somehow superior to those who have less than we have, especially the poor. Indeed, the seed that fell among the thorns may be the greatest group in our land today. A short time back, well, for some of us, a lifetime ago, there was a pop singer by the name of Madonna, the material girl herself, and she said, 
we as Americans are completely obsessed and wrapped up in a lot of the wrong values. Looking good, having cash in the bank, being perceived as rich, famous, and successful. If Madonna is right and was right, certainly she is for a segment of our society at least. It could be that that mammon or material things is God for those people. The reality is that we have to make decisions about what gives meaning to our life. What does give meaning to our life? That's a question that each one of us has to answer. This past week, as I was taking a couple days off to work on my taxes, because the deadline is July 15th, and goodness, for God forbid, that I would put things off to the last minute. What day is it, by the way? <laughs> All right. But I digress for a moment. Pam, you got to look at Pam's, you know, her head is shaking, right? Pam knows how long it takes me to get receipts turned in. But you know, as I was going through those receipts, and as I was spending time looking at things that I was rearranging in the house, because part of the time is also some spring cleaning, well, spring organizing, well, spring throwing away. But I digress, all right? But I looked at all these things, and I looked at my life, and I said, is this all there is? And, and what I really wanted to do was I wanted to go out and sit in the garage, which I told some of you is my, my new man cave, whatever that means. It's, I don't know how manly it is, because I have Christmas tree lights up in there. And, uh, and I don't have a cooler for beer. But you know, the, the point is that I, that I have my little space out there. And I go out there with my, my little lawn chairs, and I sit there, and I enjoy talking to my son. I sit out there and I enjoy reading. I sit out there and I enjoy praying. Someone said, are you gonna take a TV out there? And the answer is no. I haven't even taken any music out there because it's a time to just sit and contemplate my relationship with God and my relationship with my brothers and sisters in this world. Where are our values? Where are the things that we devote our time and energy to? Are they giving us joy and peace in our life? Now, let's, let's fast forward here. The story is about the kingdom of God. The message of the kingdom of God falls on hearts that welcome it. In those moments when you and I prioritize our lives by our relationship with God, and we see the world through the lens of the teachings of Jesus Christ, we find that our lives have meaning. What's the purpose of the sermon today? Well, the, the, let me tell you what the purpose is not, because sometimes it's, it's a good place to start out with what we're not trying to accomplish. We are not trying to accomplish for you to go home and, and weep and, and wail and gnash your teeth about how terrible a person you are. That is ridiculous. God does not desire that for any of us. Our goal is not to go home and throw everything out like the baby with the bathwater expression, but rather our goal today is to be finding that peace that passes all understanding. That's what we are looking for in our lives. That's what God wants for us. And God tells us that that is what's found in the kingdom of God. That is not what's going to happen in heaven. That is what can happen here and now. That we can experience God's love and we can live as the kingdom people. Now, you say, where do you get that nonsense from, Jim? Well, let me refer you back to the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're with me on that so far. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is out there. We are promised it when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But God does not want us to live miserably between now and then. I was reading uh, a Facebook post from a, a colleague of mine, my former district superintendent in the Buster, Butler District. He was celebrating his 50th anniversary with his wife, Linda. And he said, he, he gave a summary of the wonderful relationship that they have. He said, we both love God and we both are looking forward to going to heaven. And then he says, but not right now. And the reality is, is that God has promised us that we can live life abundantly here on earth. And we can do that when we allow God's word to fall in our hearts and be received and be nurtured in our lives. God wants each of us to be spending more time in conversation with him. And conversation that works effectively has two parts, right? One part is where we speak, and the other part is where we listen. We go to God and we share the concerns that we have, the places where we hurt, the places where it's complicated, the places where we think, ah, I can't do this for one more minute. And it's at that moment that we've shared all that, that then we sit and we listen. And God's word comes to us. The power of the Holy Spirit reveals to us what's important. And the way that that Holy Spirit reveals that to us is sometimes in the form of a text message that someone will send us. An email that someone will send us. A card. Believe it or not, they do still make cards. You can buy them. You can put stamps on them and send them. All of those things are ways in which God's love works to give us messages. And sometimes, God speaks in our hearts in ways that we don't understand, which means that we have to sit and listen a little longer. God is in the business of transforming people so they can live out the kingdom of God here on earth. Hear it again. God is in the business of transforming people so that they can live out the kingdom of God here on earth. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be dealing with the nonsense that we deal with here. But the wonderful thing is that while we are here on earth, we can set aside the nonsense and we can celebrate the love the love we share for each other. So I get a text message on Friday from someone in our church family. I, I, I want to read it to you. No, I can't because it's in the phone in the office. But the text message says, hey, the MGM team would like to, to get popsicles. <laughs> I can see them. Get boxes of popsicles and we're going to take them to all of the folks living in the apartments next door with a note sharing with them that it's from our church family. And then the, and then the person said, but you know, you don't need to worry about this, it's your day off, don't even worry about it. And I, I sent back like, it's like, love it, love it, love it. I'd be honored to go along and help pass them out. That's what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is about caring for each other. The kingdom of God is about being in prayer for people we don't even know. Michael and I have our, our prayer time. Each family has their own prayer times. Uh, we started, our prayer time changed dramatically when mom got sick. And uh, even before that, we would often pray with her by phone. But 
and she got sicker and sicker and was moving in with Jeannie and then moved in with me, uh, we would be calling her on the phone. So when mom died, one of the things that we continued to do was Michael and I continued to call each other each night to say our prayers. So Michael's in his bedroom, I'm in my bedroom, and we call and we say prayers. It's crazy, I know, but you know what? It's a part of celebrating the loving relationships that we have. And every night, each one of us pray for those people who are sick, for those people who have lost loved ones, and for those people who are struggling to find cures for the many diseases that confront us as people in this world. We will never meet the researchers who develop vaccines. But there is always that possibility that one of the young people in this church family will become the researcher that develops a cure. There's always the possibility that there will be a member of this church family's family that will go out and find ways to explain relationships and the need for acceptance and love. And the world will be transformed one person at a time by the signs of God's love. Talking about those things, looking to the scripture to guide us as we have to make difficult decisions is what our faith journey is about. That's what the community of faith is about. That's what it is to be living out the kingdom here on earth. There is much joy even in the midst of much sorrow. We must never lose sight of the joy and the abundant life that God has for us. Today as you leave, I hope you'll look into each other's eyes and tell each other how good it is to see each other. We are so blessed to be here. We're so blessed to be living in a time when there are opportunities to find ways to combat complicated illnesses. And as I said, it's a pain in the butt sometimes. And we know that. But you know what else we know? We know that there is not one of us in this room that would not sacrifice or give a pint of blood for somebody sitting next to us who needed that. Help us to continue to allow the parables of the scripture to come alive in our hearts today. I believe with 100% truthfulness that you are people of God who are the good soil and that the word of God falls upon you in, in your hearts and you are growing in ways that present the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Let no one ever tell you anything different about your church family. Let no one ever tell you anything different about you as a person of God. God is here to affirm. God is here to invite us in. God is here to transform us. God is here to take our earthen vessels of life and to put them on a potter's wheel and perfect them and make a beautiful reality out of them. And the reality of Lana's life will look very different than the reality of Joe's life. As it should, because God has gifted each of us in amazing and wonderful ways. May we go out today thanking God for his love. So I'm going to, Donna and I kind of had this worked out. Donna, of course, better than me. 
I'm going to read you the first verse of the hymn of promise. And then Donna will be playing that for you to hear. And then I will read you the last verse as our benediction. In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter there's a spring that waits to be, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. Now may the love of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace to love God, love yourself, and to love your neighbor. Amen. Amen.